everybody, Young Grasshopper here. Welcome to the Cliffside Bunker in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. And this is a strategy tactics video. In this episode, we're going to talk all about aircraft carriers. And I just want to remind everybody that this is a strategy video in which I'm going to digest many of my own opinions. And I don't really care if they're right or wrong. It's for new players to just sort of help them advance in the game and build their strategies if they are just starting playing and getting into this hobby. If you are an experienced player and a veteran to this game, please go to the comment board and just make some suggestions, you know, and if you're new to the game, go to the comment board, see what other experienced players are saying about this topic. So let's get into aircraft carriers, one of my favorite units in the game. I had a video already talking about bombers so aircraft carriers, let's start with Germany. What can Germany say about aircraft carriers? Well, I like to build one here, right here, turn one. I do this quite often, um, more often than not, that's for sure. I know that there's a lot of interesting strategies out there when it comes to land units and just pure aircraft or even just keeping all your money uh, turn one. I still find myself buying an aircraft carrier right here. Just simply because I'm pretty conservative when it comes to attacking these ships here. The Royal Navy, I like to bring the tactical bomber in. And I need that aircraft carrier to catch the tactical bomber hitting this. Now, this is a really, really unique rule. I don't know if it's just solely in G40 or these 1940 games. I don't know if it's in Anniversary Edition. I haven't played Anniversary in a long time, but... What's really interesting, and it's a new development really, is that a newly purchased aircraft carrier can catch aircraft that are attacking the same turn. So when you build it and you put it off to the side and newly purchased units get mobilized at the end of the turn, those newly purchased units, if it's an aircraft carrier hitting the board, actually gets involved and interacts with the attacking units already in play, which is really, really cool concept. I would like to go back and play Classic Edition with this rule and see how it affects that game. I mean, if we were using aircraft carriers like that back in Classic Edition, it would be, it would be cool to see how um, it changes things. But... Anyway, I want to talk in terms when talking about aircraft carriers and three different things. I I use these terms. I call it catching, bouncing, um, flexing. So I use aircraft carriers in different ways depending on who I'm playing. So in this case, when I build an aircraft carrier, I'm building it to catch the aircraft so the tactical bomber comes in here it only has one space left to land so aircraft carriers are great at just being legal landing spots and you know we talk about aircraft carriers and other units in this game as just attack value and defense value but i'm telling you uh when you sort of make the adjustment that you're going to use aircraft carriers for this purpose you know strictly legal landing spots you're going to see that your game and your your strategies really develop for example let's say britain has a really important mission with their aircraft maybe something over here maybe they just really need to sink something here and the fighters and tactical bombers so let's say one two three four five so let's say right here okay um so the fighters from here can move five one two three four now they are going to go in the drink and they really really want to hit something here it's a very important mission well be careful germany because they can build an aircraft carrier to catch those planes now even if the planes do not survive and the aircraft carrier is built just simply to allow them to do that in the first place Remember, you cannot do a combat movement with aircraft unless you can prove or determine that you do have a legal landing spot. Well, a newly purchased carrier can provide that and allow them to go here and get back to 110 because of the new purchase. Now, if, for example, these planes go and 
attack let's say it fails and they lose and they're lost at sea the aircraft carrier doesn't have to be built here anymore um, just like if the German aircraft carrier meant for here to catch the tactical bomber let's say that the tactical bomber was lost in battle here well you've got a aircraft carrier in the build queue that needs to go someplace well, you could put it here because of the factory. You could put it here because of the factory. Just simply because it no longer must go here. Now, if the tactical bomber survives, then yes, it, it must absolutely go there to catch it as the legal landing spot. So in the other example, if the Brits come here and they lose their single plane or two planes, the two planes that were supposed to land on the newly purchased aircraft and they're lost well that newly purchased aircraft can be built here because the last thing you want to do is lose aircraft plus lose an aircraft carrier if it's vulnerable to other attacks now depending on the importance of the mission and the, you consider the cost of what it's going to take to provide that legal landing spot it's going to be a 16 ipc unit now let's say it goes it succeeds in its mission it comes and lands here even if they know that they're going to be destroyed from a counterattack. depending on what you were doing the importance of that mission i've seen it happen where people are fine throwing away the aircraft carrier even if a fighter lands on it just to be able to do this and it was worth it all along so there are situations and scenarios that could happen so be aware that even though you think and you're counting out and it looks like aircraft, enemy aircraft cannot reach you, a newly purchased aircraft could just switch that and just change that in an instant, okay? So newly purchased aircrafts can catch attacking aircraft that are participating now, I'm not going to talk about Russia. There's no point in talking about Russia buying an aircraft carrier. Not going to waste the time. I'm going to go into Japan, I think. And, you know, this is going to be long and exhausted again. I don't care how long my video is. I'm having fun talking to you guys. And, you know, when I'm done, I'm done. So, Japan starts with three aircraft carriers. Obviously, one of, if not the nation in which we need to understand how to use aircraft carriers. Um, not only do they start with three, but they also start with many, many aircraft, 21 total. Now, two of those are strategic bombers. They cannot land on aircraft carriers. So let's say 19 eligible aircraft that could land on aircraft carriers, not to mention that the three that are on the board are loaded to begin with. So buying aircraft carriers is very, very viable very um, possible absolutely to build a big fleet especially if america is trying to catch up they begin the game with only one aircraft carrier but they have money they could build more and you have to be aware of america and what they're doing with their income now another thing and i'm just going to bounce back and forth um so another thing that I like to think of aircraft carriers doing is flexing. And I call aircraft carriers and cruisers and battleships muscle ships. And I explain this because they can put up strong defense, especially in a school of fish situation. I call a massive fleet just completely built up and almost untouchable. And then when it moves... To one space together all at once I call that school of fish strategy and now I'm not a big fan of it but I can see how some nations in the right situation and in the right position where a school of fish strategy is necessary um, but I try to do something called fragmenting and I'll get into that but Muscle ships like aircraft carriers, and again, they're stronger when they have fighters on them. Tactical bombers defend at three. So anytime I finish my turn, I look at my aircraft carriers, and 
when I finish my turn, especially aircraft carriers that are vulnerable to a counterattack, I always make sure that I have two fighters on there. That's going to really make that aircraft carrier flex on defense, right? So battleships, cruisers, and aircraft carriers are just muscle ships and an aircraft carrier can flex with fighters, especially two fighters, because of the extra defense ability. So let's get into back into Japan and talk about their aircraft carrier situation. Now, a lot of new players have difficulty playing Japan. And I was the same way when I started, but now I have a lot of confidence playing Japan. And I can tell you that if I am in a game that I feel like I gotta win, and I'm with a teammate and it's up to me what nation I play to guarantee a win. I mean, I'm not saying I guarantee a win, but I'm always the most confident with Japan. I want to help new players with this because I know from experience it was hard to get into playing it and understanding what is necessary and whatnot. And I think the major issue is is because we're surrounded by enemies. Take a look up here, Russia, if they declare war and they stick around up here, right? That's an enemy. And then we have China down here, right? I mean, all these territories, this could turn into a meat grinder and get out of control where they're spawning all over the place. That's an enemy. We got these tan UK British that have their own $17 economy that can be placed here on Calcutta. That's an enemy. And of course, our enemy here, Anzac Australia, that has a, an economy and a place to build. And of course, the giant America, eventually it's going to wake up and get into the war. And it's obviously an enemy. So, you know, it can be daunting. It can be intimidating knowing that Japan is surrounded by one, two, three, four five enemies all with their own turn sequence all with their own economy you know and if you don't deal with them in a surgical matter things could get out of hand quickly and i understand that i'm not saying it's easy to play japan but you know there's some things there's some habits there's some philosophies and mentalities that we can implement to help us get through it and actually you know after six seven eight rounds take a look at the board and say wow i did good you know, and a lot of it has to do with how you use your aircraft carriers. Now, I'm going to talk in later videos about other ways that Japan can thrive. But right now we're talking about aircraft carriers. We have to be good with our aircraft carriers. We have to use them economically. We have to be bold with them. They have to be in the right position all the time. And they have to be doing something important all the time. Because we just got way too much to do. We've got to take land here we got to threaten this here we got to take away national objectives we got to take these islands and if we lose them we got to take them back we got to keep america out to the outside we got to put up a naval blockade so that they don't come in and mess with us and get here and then liberate this so we have to make sure that we're using our navy properly so that the military and the army and the landings and the taking of Calcutta, the bombing of Calcutta can all go according to plan because we've got a solid blockade. Now, I've got friends that love to just attack with Japan. Their philosophy is that, hey, if the Americans are here and Japan is here, they're going to take their navy and they're going to trade with America. And there seems to be this big misunderstanding, and I don't know which side I lean on, right? The Americans will say Japan, uh, the Americans will, will say that I can lose my ships more than Japan, and Japan can say I can lose my ships more than America, right? So depending, I guess, on who you're playing, but I like to keep my Navy as much as I can. The reason being is if I've got a blockade and I'm here in a school of fish type of strategy, I'm in a better position than if America is here with the same type of units, with the same type of school of fish. Because if America attacks us, we've got our three plane scramble and our seven, or sorry, our six kamikaze tokens. That is much better than if we attack them. Well, first of all, our aircraft carriers do not get 
a dice roll on attack. So right away we are behind the eight ball. And our fighters do not um, roll out of four. They roll on a three. Now sure we might have some tactical bombers. But if we're positioned here. We're obviously got as many fighters on our aircraft carriers. And the tactical bombers are not here to defend. Anyway. When you factor in the six kamikaze tokens. And the three plane scramble. We're in a better position just to sit. I mean forget about trading forces. Now I've got my opinion that Japan's units are more valuable than America's units as a Japan player I'm not gonna instigate an attack on America as easily as if I was America I would instigate an attack on Japan instead right but I mean you you have to be mindful of these extra defense systems I mean obviously there's a three-plane scramble that could be here and that could bring their fighters come and land here once America takes it that would give them the instant defense of a three plane scramble and you know even America could have some empty aircraft carriers come here and then when they're done allowing Anzac to fly up here and land on those aircraft carriers now when it comes to multinational fighters on platforms I mean they do not work as efficiently as a lot of people think I mean, it makes sense when you are defending a fleet. Yeah, okay, um, I will provide the fighters as Anzac and you, America, provide the empty aircraft carriers. And we'll work together and we will bring our economies together to have a bigger fleet than we think that we would if America had to buy the fighters along with the aircraft carriers. And, you know, it does make sense on paper, but once you get those multinational fighters on top of those aircraft carriers, you're going to find, as the Allies, that you're a little bit more handcuffed than you wanted to be. All right? But anyway, it's it's great for initial defense. Just don't make it a, a, a game-long strategy. All right? Now, again, <laughs> back to Japan, right, and their, and their aircraft carriers and how to use them, right? Let me show you something. Um, I did a J-1 video a long, long time ago, and I'm going to show you a move that is part of the J-1 attack. And I'm only going to be dealing with a couple of carriers here, okay? And I'm going to call this bouncing. So just like all kinds of aircraft carriers together in a school of fish strategy that have two fighters on each platform that's flexing muscle ships right and that's going to be very very hard to attack and penetrate right it works really well for the americans also right here in 91 right when they don't want to be attacked or they're trying to uh, protect transports from a large stack of german bombers right the platforms with the fighters here um, with other muscle ships is going to be very difficult to penetrate so that's flexing now this i call bouncing i'm going to show you so this aircraft carrier here let's take these off now i'm going to explain something before i move these it's very necessary so i want you guys to remember this there's a rule or a mechanic or an understanding and again the rule books I'm, I can't point out to you where this is, but after reading the frequently asked forums and the pages and pages that are there, I've come to understand this and I can't dig it up for you. There's just way too many, but trust me when I say this, okay? So you can take it to the bank that even before your turn starts, even before the purchase new units, even before combat movement, even before any of that all these planes take off so this is where your mindset needs to be all your aircraft on your aircraft carriers launch they take off they're in the air and you know let's just look at it like this okay so your your attacks haven't even started yet and we're going to do this and we're going to say okay these have all taken off you're going to begin your combat movements like this you're going to begin now with this apart from these. And this is helpful to understand because a lot of new players think that the aircraft on top of the aircraft carrier 
need to move together. I know that they, they don't believe it because it's not in the rules that way, but you know, mentally they're stuck in quicksand strategically because they say, oh, I'm going to attack this with all this. Now that's absolutely legal, right? But you know, why would you do that? This is like coloring uh, with crayons instead of an airbrush, okay? You wanna be creative. And every time that I'm playing with somebody and they call me to their side of the board and say, hey, I'm finishing up my turn. What do you think of what I'm doing here, right? And this is just good practice between teammates to get extra eyeballs because it's like, oh, you got to watch and be careful that it can hit that. Oh, okay, thanks. So it's great to have your teammates look at things, right? So call them over before you're getting ready to attack. So let's say my teammate comes over and, you know, He's, he's moving all of his attacks and he calls me over and he's like, okay, he's got attacks here. He's doing some China stuff, right? And he pulls this in, right? And he's got other stuff he's doing in landing, right? And then he calls me over and says, okay, what do you think of everything I'm doing, right? Am I missing anything? And I say, well, the first thing I'm going to say is, well, is there anything more creative you can do with this, right? And that's, that's the key, right? And I don't mean creative like, you know, stop doing something sensible and just go into doing something because it looks pretty. No, I mean, I mean sensible or sorry, more creative because there's almost always a better way of doing things, right? Rather than just, okay, these are glued to this and it must move as one. Well, when you understand that the rules and again... If somebody could figure it out and find out in the rule book what paragraph and what page this is mentioned in, I mean, it's buried too deep in the forum thread to bring up. But essentially, before combat even begins, all these aircraft on your carriers leave. And I think it is something that matters when talking about a certain gambit. And again, I read it so long ago, years ago, but... The important thing is, is that we understand that this is happening. It frees our mind to know that this is free. It can do whatever it wants. It doesn't, it's not tied to these. And the same thing the other way, these planes are not tied to this. And I don't want to keep beating this rabbit, but um, it it's when, when, when you see new players constantly moving your planes with your platforms, you know, you just want to uh, stop and, and show them a video. But going back to our J1 scenario. So let's say, for example, these two planes are coming one, two, and three here in the Philippines as part of a, as part of a amphibious assault, okay? And we're just doing a quick scenario. So amphibious assault, okay, now we're going to bring this down. Well, here's the idea. We're not going to bring that down. I'm going to show you something, okay? Let's just bring that. So we're going to get rid of this. It protects, this is protected by the scramble, of course, right? We got this, we got this, we got this, we got this. That's enough. So just putting together a short scenario of an amphibious assault, all right? I guess if we're going to do it, we might as well do it right. So we're bringing four units, okay? So we got the two planes here and this carrier is now bare. So these two aircraft which came from this are not married to this. This can go and do whatever it wants and we got a plan for this. It's gonna do something different but we need a carrier to be provided here to catch these planes because they are max in there. One, two, and three must land four. So there must be an aircraft carrier here. Now we're not going to bring an aircraft carrier in because there's a sea battle, all right? There's no need to bring in the aircraft carrier. Why? Because we have to catch the planes. And if we're in a situation where we're going to tip this, we can't because we'll lose the planes. So there's no point in bringing this in. We just gotta make sure we don't move it and have it doing something else because it's required down here. If we don't bring the legal landing spot, now, if we go and run this there and run this there, I mean, obviously we can't do our combat movements because the aircraft need to, to land legally before anything happens. 
and if this goes does something that goes does something that goes does and there's no way that these can, can land legally on an aircraft carrier then this is not legal it's not possible you're not going to roll this out unless there's an aircraft carrier provided or the planes just can't come in but we are going to have an aircraft carrier we're going to leave it there okay and that's a bare platform that's a bare platform getting the mindset of knowing that these planes are not married to these units here they can go and do their own thing we're going to do something called bouncing okay so these planes bounced from this aircraft carrier into here and they're going to land on a different aircraft carrier these have bounced okay they're going to go do something else they bounce from this go do something else land somewhere else all right now once once this is done and these two units are gone and in the non-combat movement phase, let's say, for example, because we are tacking. Um, I'm just trying not to goof up this. I'm just trying not to goof up this um, example because people are going to say, oh, that can't reach there and things like that. I mean, obviously, I'm just trying to, to put up a small example. So here we're going to do this okay we did this and we did this obviously we're doing other things as well but uh these planes bounce now this hasn't moved it's going to move during non-combat right and this hasn't moved and this hasn't moved they're going to move maybe during non-combat but the planes that belonged on here went and did this now during non-combat movements we need to make sure that these land on something so after the sea battle this comes down you know, and again, I hope you understand uh, the the pointlessness of bringing this in to a sea battle. It can't. You're, it's not like you're going to use it as a casualty, and it doesn't have an attack value as it is. All right. So these are going to catch these two planes that bounced from this, and this one is going to just go one, two, and three, and kind of protect this transport. This is what happened in the J1 attack description that I made, the video I made long ago. So now these, one, two, three, four, these that bounced from this are gonna come here, all right? So that is a good way, a creative way, an efficient way to use aircraft carriers when you bounce them. Now, let me give you a bigger, grander scale. Let's say you've got five aircraft carriers here and they're fully loaded right here five plus landings and destroyers and everything else but a large aircraft carrier fleet five fully loaded let's say you've got 10 fighters and tactical bombers right here now it's time to land in calcutta and there's going to be a big battle right Here's a grander example of bouncing. So all 10 aircraft that were uh, that are on these aircraft carriers are going to go one, two, three, and maybe they own this, okay? Let's say that they own this. Let's say Japan owns this, okay? And it's time to attack India. So five fully loaded aircraft carriers right here. All 10 of those aircraft on those platforms are gonna bounce one, two, and three, and four, and land here, all right? And all the aircraft here, all 10 of them are gonna go one, two, and three, and land on here, all right? Now they can even pull up here and, and like one, two, three, four. The point is that the 10 aircraft that were on five platforms here are gonna bounce and go land someplace else. And the five here that required the legal landing spot are the five platforms. So you're swapping 10 for 10. And that way you can get 20 aircraft in on one battle just by using your aircraft carriers in that way, right? So as Japan, you really want to soak in all of these different ways because aircraft carriers honestly are your best friend. And you don't want to just willy-nilly put them out there and expose them and lose them. Trust me, that kind of stuff is going to catch up with you because you've got a lot of enemies to deal with. You may have to come in and deal with these or if they take this, come back up here and take these out because, you know, or maybe you want to take them more. 
you want to take at least half of these territories, maybe back them up to their last three and take the majority of that. That's going to take resources, going to take land units, going to take factories. Of course, we want to be down here to take away national objectives and to have this spot to threaten these islands. But also, too, to build up and get ready for a landing. Maybe there's been strategic bombing raids. Maybe there's been convoys on this factory. And you're building up to do a landing, which, you know, we should always be thinking about. So we want to keep them backed off from becoming uncontrollable. We want to take this economy down and, and pancake this factory if we can. And we want to take these islands as soon as we can for the money and if they are taking taken away from us we need to have the discipline and the know-how not to give up on the islands like you know oh you had them all once and you collected your five ipc bonus but now the allies have been chewing away at this like a like a, a school of piranhas that are just taking away all your islands back and now you've lost some resources because of an auto killer too on some transports you got to take them back this is where your money is you cannot sustain anything unless you have these so i if i take them early and then i lose one or two to the allies i don't give up on the islands i create a plan to go back and take them and you know what just as hard as it is to muster up those transports and go back and take something that you already lost once is going to be just as hard for the allies to do the same. It's like, man, we, we, we gathered all these resources, we went in, we took these islands away from them, we pat ourselves on the back, and now he's taken them back, and now can we rebuild what we need to go and take them back a second time? I mean, it's necessary. There's just that much money here. But getting away from that, aircraft carriers, you don't wanna just put them up and spot them everywhere. You know to save a transport here and there because if they're taken out i mean i would take out a very small japanese fleet right here i would take that out i'd do everything i can to take that out because what's even harder is if they are flexing as muscle ships in a school of fish kind of strategy right here around philippines and then when the americans go back here because this is left bare and they want to threaten that then this school of fish can just move right back up here and they got the same kamikaze odds and they get the same three plane scramble odds and they've got muscle ships aircraft carriers loaded with at four fighters and whether it's here or whether it's here it's difficult to deal with as the allies and that's another thing that you need to learn to use your aircraft carriers with not just bouncing and catching planes, but muscle ships create that naval blockade, right? So last thing I want to talk about when it comes to Japan in this subject is fragmenting. And we're going to talk a lot about this, I'm going to probably dedicate a whole video to this when it comes to fragmenting. What I mean by that is that Japan has a lot of little battles going on. You know, when it comes time, whether it's turn two or turn three and it's time, they're going to take some islands. They're going to do an amphibious assault. They're going to take some Chinese territories. They're going to kill a couple of lone boats, maybe. They're going to strategic bombing raid or get into position to or get into position to convoy. And when it comes to taking this and taking this and taking more Chinese territories, doing the amphibious assault here, and you know maybe taking out a blocker up here i mean honestly you can't have the mentality that you're going to take everything that you own to go do one or two things because there's so many little skirmishes because there's so many little battles on all kinds of different fronts against all kinds of different enemies remember we got russia we got china we got uk we got anzac we got america so we have to do a little bit against everybody when they give us that opportunity when they leave something vulnerable and it's like, you know what, I'm going to take two men, a tank and a fighter, or I'm going to take two men, a tactical bomber and a fighter, or I'm going to take one sub, one destroyer against this. And your amphibious assaults are lean, they're light because you got other amphibious assaults to do. You got to take this out. Maybe a bombardment on this is going to help. And, you know, you don't have your bombers to take out. Chinese territories anymore because now they're going to do a strategic bombing raid and you know this type of strategy this type of tactics when it comes to what I call fragmenting is so essential for Japan 
I mean, other nations can benefit from this, but Japan must survive by this. You know, Japan must have, you know, 10 or more different battles, whether they be small land battles, small sea battles, or one big sea battle, and many, many different small land battles. And then that's how all these control markers get up on the board. You know, if you see some Facebook pictures or some game reports on YouTube where you see all these Japan markers everywhere, you know, Japan has just controlled everything, right? I mean, that's not by accident. That takes, that takes strategy, it takes patience, it takes discipline, you know, and it takes fragmenting. You got to go out there and you got to steal, you know, 10 battles, Per term because you know that when you've got this many enemies surrounding you you're going to have a, an entire game round of different nations chewing at you taking a bite here taking a bite there until it becomes your turn and then you got to do it all over again get all your battles in with the positioning and your units as much as possible but aircraft carriers are essential in driving this engine of fragmenting because you know platforms like this are essential when it comes to just one thing and one thing only and that is legal landing spots so if you think about it let's say america's has some boats here let's say sorry anzac has some boats here let's say uk pacific has some boats here and you're thinking to yourself, how can I reach, right? How can I reach the Philippines from way over here? How can I reach these boats from way up here? How can I reach these blockers from Manchuria? And the, and the first thing that you got to think about is like, okay, count it out. Don't just think, okay, I can't reach. Count it out. And if you, if you can reach something and have one more space remaining, if you can reach these blockers and have one more space remaining, then maybe, just maybe, there's an aircraft carrier around that can get there. And how glorious of a battle it would be if you could send aircraft in on something that the enemy absolutely does not want to lose, and you get there and you reach it, and you destroy them all, and you're caught on aircraft carriers with no enemy around to counter it. Right? So first and foremost, yes, aircraft carriers are attacking units and defending units. But more than that, aircraft carriers are legal landing spots. And that's the biggest role that they could provide because those aircraft can be the devastating um, lethal weapons, right? As long as they can get there. And the aircraft carriers allow them to get there. Now, we talked about aircraft carriers being attacking units. Remember what we did in this scenario where we brought... A bare aircraft carrier down here and we didn't actually bring it into the attack because it's useless in that case now obviously when it comes to aircraft carriers in other situations it's not so much useless like for example the Toronto raid and it's not the Toronto raid guys <laughs> uh, I get a kick out of that I mean I'm from Toronto Canada but this is the Toronto raid the Toronto Harbor in which the aircraft carrier uh, of the British came in in an experiment destroyed these with just aircraft carriers I mean I know that most of you know the story but if you're just getting into this game and you're just learning about World War II because of it the Toronto raid was the blueprint the Japanese took and they were very mindful and they took that and how successful it was they were watching very closely for their Pearl Harbor raid so they saw how the Brits did against Italy in the Toronto raid and it inspired them and allowed them to begin the process of planning Pearl Harbor. So obviously coming in here with a fleet as an attacking unit with aircraft is more viable than perhaps Japan doing the same. So it depends on the situation, it depends on the nation, it depends on you know, how confident you are or what your purpose is. I mean, we can go up and down about this aircraft carrier. And I love it. I absolutely love it. I'll talk all day about the Mediterranean. I love the Mediterranean theater in this game. 
It's so exciting to me. It bothers me when teammates just ignore it as Italy and Germany and just go someplace else. Or it bothers me if I've got a teammate on the Allies side who just takes this and squeezes it through here and goes into the Indian Ocean. In my opinion, taking this aircraft carrier and coming through the Suez Turn 1 and keeping it safe or pretending that it's safe here is, in my opinion, the most annoying pet peeve I have. Um... Because I've seen it so many times that it comes through here turn one and it floats in the Indian Ocean all game long. It's not part of something big enough to challenge the Japanese. And in most cases, when you do that, chances are you can't get back in because you've left the Italians too strong and they're going to close that canal. Okay. Now, what are some good things to do about this? Well, the Taranto Raid. But also, too, taking these out and non-combat moving this here with a fleet, a massive fleet with maybe an air base and a three-plane scramble and everything else. I mean, those are some strategies that are viable. In the past, I've either said, okay, do Tobruk or do Taranto, one or the other. But this one has become viable. It's actually been the, been the driving force of uh, forcing Germany to buy three fires to come down here to do something I just learned called a Libyan snake. Um, Gargantua has been uh, showing me that. But regardless, I've got three options now as in the med, like take out Tobruk, take out Taranto, or bring everything here to come back home and build a massive fleet and do something else. But, you know, in my tournament edition rules, I'll just bring this up. I mean, I knew that they wanted to do the Africa token. So what I did was I boldly attacked both Tobruk and Taranto and Miraculously, it worked out for me and I lost very little. So that was a good game to just squash their hopes on getting that token. But going back to out of box now, um, very exciting what to do with this aircraft carrier. There's lots of flavor in the med. It's my favorite place to play. So if I was to pick a second um, nation to play after Japan, it would be the Brits. And even after that, it would be Italy. I mean, a lot of people would have... Germany high on their list as favorite nations to play but after Japan because I'm confident with them I would play the Brits just simply because it's just so much fun playing in the med and then if not the Brits then I would love to play the Italians because um, I always seem to do well with the Italians I always seem to have a good philosophy with them Germany not so much I mean I'm not a prolific <laughs> German player I mean I do not have much confidence with Germany which is unfortunate because German strategy videos are very popular but um, anyway, um, so we talked about America and their aircraft carriers. I've seen them in a school of fish mentality because they need to be protected. Aircraft carriers are expensive. And when you're buying aircraft carriers and muscle ships to go in the Pacific to go up against these types of starting units with all these aircraft. And I know that Japan always feels like they're outnumbered and stuff, but think about it. I mean, you got 21 aircraft. If you use them properly, right, you're going to strike the fear of, um, of those uh, zeros into the hearts of Americans on this side, right? To the point where maybe they'll just abandon the Pacific altogether, which is viable. But for America, buying aircraft carriers, yes, but um, they're mostly used in the role of just flexing as part of a massive fleet with muscle ships. I don't see them fragmenting much because it would be really demoralizing to just lose a single aircraft carrier and a destroyer just hanging out over there. I mean, you know, their positioning and what they need to do in this game doesn't really call for fragmenting. Doesn't really call for, uh, you know, going out and catching aircraft. I mean, not like Japan. Now, I don't like the idea of buying an aircraft carrier for Anzac. I mean, they have... When it comes to Anzac, you want to prioritize and think to yourself, you know, what are the uh, top three, top five units for them to buy, right? And I always place like fighters, submarines, infantry and transports ahead of aircraft carriers. I would even place a strategic bomber ahead of an aircraft carrier. I know that you're thinking maybe that there's enough planes here. But these planes can do so many other different things first before landing on a newly purchased aircraft for Anzac. 
I mean, what I use these for, and because I place high importance on this spot for America, so America must get here to the Carolina Islands. America must have a successful amphibious assault. America must have enough ships to be here and be safe. But because they newly take it, and it's quite possible that the Japanese are here, because they newly take it, I mean, it's going to be incredibly valuable to them if they have the three-plane scramble needed for their newly taken air base. And that's where these three planes come in. Now, I would put that mission to get those three planes here. It's the only three planes that can get there to help provide that three-plane scramble when they first arrive. I would put so much more value on that mission than just building an aircraft carrier just so that these planes have something to do, right? And even after that, secondly after that, I mean, planes here can can come here while neutral and then come here and then help defend, can even get to Moscow. I remember a game where I just kept shipping them to Moscow. But anyway, we're talking about aircraft carriers. And of course, I do not recommend one. Again, it's one of those things where I can think of five different units that would be better to be purchased protecting Calcutta before an aircraft carrier, right? All right, so Italy, finally Italy. Yes, it is viable that they buy an aircraft carrier. And yes, I have seen it done many times. And yes, I've done it myself many times. And it's maybe turn three at the earliest, turn four, turn five. You don't want to get too late, but you're going to buy an aircraft carrier because you've got the fighters. Fighters are something that you buy a lot of in the first two or three turns. And then when you're lucky with them and you've kept them and you have more than uh, three or four fighters, then especially if you have your battleship, if you've kept your battleship, you know, maybe you've kept this and you want to add to that to protect that and you've lost this. The point is, if you're going to buy a ship to help protect protect the ships you already have then an aircraft carrier is an excellent purchase it's better than buying this i don't even remember how much this is is a battleship 20 or 18 i think it's 20 i i, I rarely buy battleships because aircraft carriers are just that much more better i mean i i use them better but you know obviously you're planting a platform here to catch a couple of fighters you already have on the board to protect ships that you want to keep now i've seen people buy an aircraft carrier for italy in the wrong timing it's usually two rounds before they're going to lose their fleet anyway and it's inevitable so two rounds before the attack on the italian fleet the italians say okay it's now or never i'm either going to surrender my fleet and use it as blockers and it's going to get destroyed or i'm going to spend the money to build it up and try and save it now, more often than not, when the Americans are coming in here with a big fleet, it's better not to spend that kind of money on something that needs to stay in the water. Um, but anyway, uh, there are situations where Italy could very easily put an aircraft carrier there and use it to wreck all kinds of havoc in this area, including taking a lot of this and taking a lot of this and just thriving. I mean... If Italy, if you have not seen Italy thrive in a game in a long time, then you've got to do something different with Italy. Now, I understand that every other game, something could happen that just reduces Italy to a protector of Paris or can openers for the Germans. But, but that shouldn't be every game. Okay, there's always should be a game spotted in here and there where there's Italian roundels everywhere because that's what you're trying to do with them. And if it doesn't work out like that early, then their role changes and I get that. But what you should be trying to do with Italy is take a lot of this, the Middle East, there's a lot of money there. This is $5 for Germany if you can get there, but it all comes down to fleet. And transports protected so that the land units can hit over here and then up here protected with um, a three plane scramble and whatnot trying to keep your big fleet as long as you can to sustain that growth 
all right so i think that's it guys i think that's aircraft carriers i mean i went through all the different nations i talked a lot about it i mean i, I hope i'm not forgetting anything the thing is aircraft carriers can do so much and i've seen aircraft carriers um just come out aces in certain situations there's one thing that i want to talk about i almost forgot okay i got a set something up here this happened to me a long time ago a long time ago and i just want to tell a story about what happened i'm going to tell a story all right so i'm in a six player game it's early in my axis and allies career and i'm learning how to play japan and i started off playing poorly and it's interesting this is an interesting uh interesting story so i've got all this coming in here um let's say i got this i need a second right you know that's coming in that's coming in and that's coming in and this so foolishly i mean i'm learning how to play japan right foolishly i i come in here with this turn one and of course these two are in the setup so this is my attack all right and um sorry what was it what was it these had moved these weren't there those had moved all right so i'm trying to remember how this played out this is right this is the way it is so these are there so i'm doing an amphibious assault with two transports three aircraft carriers all these planes here i'm pretty much guaranteed to take this okay and I don't see any boats here that are going to trigger a sea battle. So I bring in my aircraft carriers. I don't need an attack value, right? So just as I'm doing this, I'm attacking. I think it's turn two or turn three. And I'm, I'm fragmenting. I'm doing all these. Just as my buddy, who is an excellent player, my buddy looks over at the table and says, Man, you are getting really good at Japan. And I said, Thanks, right? I haven't started rolling yet. And I'm just doing all my attacks and i'm getting ready to roll them out and he says man you you're getting really good at japan and then i say okay i'm ready to do my attacks combat moves are over and then the american player says i scramble and i destroy all your boats right so i look at this and i'm like and i'm, I'm looking at it, i'm looking at it, i'm like okay i don't have an attack value right and i'm thinking to myself did i just lose all my ships and it was a six player game. Now, mind you, we had started off very, um, like this This happened very early with all of us. I think it was 2012 and the game hadn't been out long enough. And this whole sort of no attack value with the aircraft carriers was all kind of new. We're trying to learn the rules and whatnot. So like he says, I scramble, you lose all your boats. And I'm trying to think about it. I'm trying to think. I, I'm asking people on the. Is this right? Do I lose all my boats? And everybody was agreeing to a man. It's like, yeah, I think you do, man. I think you lose all your boats. We tried to think about it. It's like these don't have attack value. These don't have attack value. So one unit can destroy all this, right? And I was like so mad because I couldn't think of the thing that would make it different. Would make this not true, right? And I just take all my units and I'm just like, I take all this and this lands and these sink because they got no aircraft carriers. I lose it all. I'm so mad. I'm so mad. And just as my friend said, you're getting better with Japan, right? But here's the thing about that. Now I'm going to close with this. I'm going to finish up this video. It's getting long. Here's the thing with that. Okay. So with all this here, and I found this out later, obviously, obviously I didn't think of it in, in, in game, but I asked about this later and it made me even more mad that nobody could help me figure out this. But when this scrambles like that and it rolls because I don't have any attack values, so there will be a roll, there will be a combat, I have no attack values, right? So now the defender goes ahead and rolls, and let's say he, for example, hits on a four, he hits, well, I just damage one, and then I retreat. 
I just damage one and then I retreat. Right? I retreat there. It's like, oh, that was silly. And, you know, I didn't see that. But I, I didn't lose all my stuff. And nobody could sit there and help me and say, oh, yeah, just take one casualty and retreat. You're the attacker. You can retreat. Every one of us to a man. And, again, we were really young learning this game. But I lost so much stuff. I was so mad. But I was even more mad later, weeks later, when I went on the Axe and Allies forum and learned that I didn't have to lose all my stuff. But again, it's just a little story, a little lesson when it comes to using aircraft carriers because of their non-existent attack value. You want to make sure. And again, you know, understand that if this happened and some of these aircraft needed one of these, you take this, the two aircraft that were going to land on there, they're gone. They're lost. Now, mind you, the aircraft that needed to land here, they would have to have more movement points to come here. So they could have been lost, right? But to lose all of this, that can retreat. But even if the aircraft can come back and land on your platforms, remember that this cannot. As soon as you take damage, remember our attack scenario coming in here. There's no point in bringing in the aircraft carrier in that scenario because as soon as it takes a casualty, and becomes damaged aircraft cannot land on him i think it's very 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 cool i think aircraft carriers have really developed over the course of many many different franchise games to just become this awesome unit nobody complains about aircraft carriers i mean they might complain about the cruiser in relation to the aircraft carrier they might complain about the battleships and their viability or their ability to hit the board or their um, cost structure in light of the aircraft carrier but nobody's complaining about aircraft carriers themselves they're just very cool and they work and they are represented very efficiently in this game well that's it guys it's almost an hour i'm going to cut this off and i hope it was uh cool i hope it was uh i had a lot of fun talking about aircraft carriers i, I always have fun talking about this game and I hope that it was useful for you guys. So make comments and tell me if, uh, you know, there's something else I missed or maybe a strategy that you have for aircraft carriers. Let's build up the comment board. Thanks a lot, guys. Cheers. May all your rolls be once. Till the next time, take care.